In Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Alhamdulillah, we are here again another day, and we're continuing with our topic, the lawful and the unlawful things in life. And for the past week, we've been focusing in on the lawful and the unlawful in regards to clothing, clothing for women and clothing for men. Yesterday, we spoke about what is considered to be nakedness for a woman and for a man. And before we continue with that discussion today, let's first um, review some of the quest some questions from yesterday's lecture. So bear with me as I uh, set this up because I forgot I have to always have it set up before the class. So give me a second to open up my PowerPoint and now I can open up the quiz. And you guys inshallah will be able to see my screen. Okay, here we go. Hold on, let me make this smaller to cover it up more. Okay, here we go. We spoke yesterday about what is considered aura or nakedness for women and what a law considers nakedness to be for a man. So let's start with the first question. Who can tell us what is considered to be the areas that have to be covered on a man? In other words, what areas, what areas of the man's body is considered nakedness and must be covered when around other men or publicly? Let's see who can answer that. And again, the naked areas of the body are not just to be covered uh, around, um, <clears throat> you know, out in the public, but even around other men or other women, you don't want to expose these parts of the body. So what are the parts of the body for the Muslim man that must be covered when he's out publicly and when he's around others? People on, okay, mashallah, good job. Everybody's getting that right. For the, from the navel to the knees. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I was gonna, exactly, the navel to the knees. From the navel to the knees, good job, Zarina. Okay, does everyone understand that? So what does that mean? Let's put the um, question back up here. And again, and we'll put the answer there too. That means whenever, whenever a man is outside publicly, <clears throat> the parts of his body that must be covered are the areas between the navel and the knees. And even when he's around other men, that area must still <laughs> remain covered. <clears throat> okay, good job. So now let's look at question number two. What is considered to be nakedness for a woman? In other words, what parts of the woman's body must be covered publicly and around uh, other women? What parts of the woman's body? Well, let's just say what parts of the woman's body is considered to be order for her? What is the woman's nakedness? Let's see the answers on Facebook. Okay, Sister May Leon said, the woman's nakedness is her entire body except for the face and the hands. Good job, Sister Isra. Good job again, Sister Zarina. Good job, Sister Laylee. So for a woman, it's different. Every part of our body must be covered publicly, except for our face and hands. And again, a lot of people have a, have a problem with this, but it shows the hikmah or the wisdom of Allah. There's a lot of Muslims that say, well, you mean to tell me that the face is the most beautiful part of the body and a woman can show her face. Well, first of all, that's our perception. We may think 
that the face is the most beautiful part of the body. But all of Allah's creation is beautiful. The arms are beautiful. The back is created beautifully. The feet, okay? And also when looking at the face, it depends on your preference. Beauty lies in the eye of the beholder anyway. And also, again, for you brothers, one thing about COVID, remember uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that there's good in everything. Well, there's good with this COVID. The good thing about COVID is all those brothers, those men who have been sticklers for a woman covering her face, they now get to see what it feels like. When you leave your home, it's the law in most places of the world, you have to put a mask on. Do you now, the, for the first time, men get to see how difficult it is to breathe when your face is covered, how hot it is, how suffocating it can be. And again, would a law place a burden on us like that? Remember guys, Allah knows his creation better than we know ourselves. Would Allah be so cruel and mean to say that a woman has to cover her face sitting here unable to breathe, to suffocate in the heat. So now those men who have been so adamant on trying to oppress women with that nonsense. Now you see what it feels like. See if you can walk around with your, you don't even want to wear a mask, but you wanted your wives to cover their entire face and peek out of a hole, like they're a cyclops animal or something. So again, that's the good thing about COVID. You know, uh, now some of those oppressive men get to see what it's like and they get to see, the rest of us get to see the beauty of Allah, how Allah knows his creation better than we know ourselves. How Allah has wisdom that few can understand that Allah would never punish us with his laws. Allah makes his laws for our protection, for our betterment. He doesn't make the laws to punish us or oppress us. So that proves that, that how could you think that your Lord would be so unmerciful that he'd make us expect a woman to walk around with her face covered outside? Okay, so what is the nakedness of the woman? Her entire body except her face and hands and hands are self-explanatory. If I walked around in gloves, how can I eat? How can I use my fingers properly? A law doesn't make laws to constrict us, to punish us. A woman should be able to move her hands and pick up things and, 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 and catch things just like a man. With gloves on, I'm constricted. I can't feel where I'm at, can't touch where I'm at. You want women to wear gloves and cover their face? Bumping in the walls? SubhanAllah brothers, well you get to see the nonsensity of that. And you get to see that Allah would never, ever, ever impose such laws on a woman or any of his other creation that would oppress them, constrict them disable them okay all right let's look at question number three can a woman and this is a question that a lot of muslims ask can a woman look at a man's body parts except for his nakedness in other words if a woman is watching television or, or something where you're talking, can a woman look at a man's other than his order and give me your evidence? Or can a woman look at a man's body other than his nakedness without lust, without desire? I'm talking about just, you know, look, without lust or desire other than his nakedness. and give me your evidence. Yeah, there's a lot of Muslim women that do wear gloves and, 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 and niqabs, that's their business. If a woman chooses to do that, then that's her prerogative. 
But I'm talking about these men that want to make women do that. A woman doesn't have to wear gloves, nor does she have to cover her face. But there is oppressive men who want to make them do that. If a woman chooses to do those things, that's her prerogative. My sister-in-law wears gloves and wears an ikab. That's her business. Okay? But my brother doesn't make her do that. She does it because it's her choice. It's her culture. Okay? Can a woman look at a man's body parts without lust or temptation other than his aura? Brother Tarek said yes, as long as it's not with temptation and lust. The prophet's wife, Aisha, was allowed to watch the Abyssinians when they were participating in their spear play in the courtyard of the prophet's mosque. Exactly, there's your evidence. There's your evidence. And again, it just, as long as it doesn't in involve lust or temptation, if you want to go to a, a ballet or a play or something like that, you watch people dancing and playing or whatever, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. And the same with men. The men can men can look at a woman's body parts other than her aura, as long as there is no lust involved. And living in a non-Muslim country, you can't help but see the women's nakedness. Because women walk around in America without any clothes on. So you're going to have to tune that stuff out anyway. If you want to live here in America. But if it bothers you to see women walking around in bikinis and halters, then you need to move someplace else to save your soul. Because that's another question. Sister Layla, you know, uh, I have a hard time. Then move to another part of the world. Move to the Middle East or something where women have to cover up publicly. You don't want to compromise your soul for anything. But for people that grew up here in America, they look at people walking around half naked and it's, it's you just become, it doesn't bother you because you see it all the time. You're surrounded by the evil. That's why Allah, the prophet said, the strong believer is more loved by Allah than a weak one. Because it's strong. You, you have to be strong to resist the temptation in a country like America. Good job, Brother Tarek. Let's see, Sarah Ali. Same question, I mean, answer. Let's see what answer we got on Facebook here. Can a woman look at a man's body other than his nakedness? Medina said yes, as long as there is no temptation. She gave the same hadith. Mayleon, yes, the same hadith. Layli, yes, the same hadith. May, yes, the same hadith, same from Sister Latifa, same from Sister Precious, Sister Amina, Isra, good job. Also, there's another hadith. This is the same day, the same circus that the Ethiopians came and they were performing in the courtyard of the mosque. They were uh, playing their little instruments, the men were doing their dance, you know, and all of that. And so Umar came out the mosque. He was angry. He picked up some rocks and started throwing rocks, telling them to, the pagans to get away from the house of Allah with that nonsense. And the prophet told him, uh, Umar, to leave the people be. He said, they're, you know, they're outside. They're not inside the mosque or anything. He said, leave them be. You know, every people have their celebration. And this is the, the Ethiopian celebration. Okay, let the people watch and enjoy. So he, to, he told Umar, leave the pe people alone, let the people enjoy their performance. And they were performing with their spears, doing that spear dance and all of that. Okay, let's look at the next question. Question, oh, let me put it here too. And that's the evidence. Let me put that answer there. Question number four. Oh, it's the same question. You already answered it. Okay, question number five. Now, this is where we get off into what Muslims 
argue about for centuries, which I don't understand why they do. When the prophets saw the law with Lehi Wasam's companions were clear on this. Allah says in the Quran and in the interpretation, the meaning that they should not display their adornment except that which is apparent of it. Now, when we look at that verse of the Quran and break it down, Allah is speaking about women. He is saying women should not display their adornment except that which is apparent of it. When he speaks about adornment, adornment of a woman includes what things? When Allah is saying that we women should not display our adornment, what is he speaking about? What is considered adornment of a woman? What is adornment for us? What is a adornment of a for a woman or adornment of a woman? What is it for us? What is our adornment? Okay, Brother Tarek said adornment includes her face, her hands. No, what is adornment? We talked about the meaning of the word adornment. What this is an English word. What is the meaning of the word adornment? Because that's the problem. We don't even understand the meaning of simple English words. When a law says a woman cannot display her adornment, what is that adornment referring to? Okay, Sister Isra said the beauty of the woman, her natural shape. whatever she does to enhance her appearance. Okay, let me put my screen up here. We're gonna break it down. I want y'all to break down what is adornment. Okay, adornment refers to the decorations. Remember what, what's the meaning? Decorations, ornaments. or whatever is used to beautify the woman, the woman's outer appearance, my outer appearance. Also the designs and fabric worn including jewelry. All of this, you know, helps to enhance my outer appearance, but it also refers to the face and the hands and the body parts. That means all body parts. So not just the face and hands, but the, my entire body. Remember, every part of the woman's body is, a, is aura. So when we talk about what Allah is saying here that they should not display their adornment, adornment refers to decorations, ornaments, or whatever is used to beautify the woman's outer appearance. It includes the designs and the, of the, and the fabric worn and the jewelry. And it also refers to her face and hands and other body parts. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so when we talk about adornment, we're talking about everything. We're talking about our whole body as a woman and what we wear the decorations of my hijab, the colors of the fabric, the material, the designs, all that is adornment for us women. So now that we understand what adornment is, then we move to the next part of that, of that uh, verse. Allah says a woman should not display their adornment 
except that which is apparent of it. This is the problem too that Muslims don't understand about this verse. What is the meaning of except what is apparent of it? What is the meaning of except what is apparent? Allah says that I cannot show my decorations, ornaments, designs, fabric, or jewelry, or body parts, except what is apparent of it. What is the meaning of except what is apparent of it? And who gives us this meaning? It's important to answer with the who gives this meaning because most Muslims don't understand their own plain, simple English. What is meant by that? Except that which is apparent. What does that mean? Okay, what does except that which is apparent mean, Brother Tarek? What is another simpler way of saying that in English? What is a simpler way of saying that? Sister Omi Barrow said a simpler way of saying that is except what can be seen on the parts allowed to be seen, in other words. What can be seen of what Allah, Allah allows us to, to show publicly. Allah allows us to wear beautiful clothing. So you can see my decorations on my uh, dress. You can see the glitter on my hijab. You can see the fabric, the designs in my fabric. And also, it includes the, the, my face and hands. Those are the only parts of my body that you can see my adornment of. You can see what I put on my face. You can see what I covered and put on my hands, but you cannot see what's on my feet. You cannot see what's on my leg. You can't see what's on my thigh. You can't see what's on my chest or my back. Does everybody get it? Does everybody get it? So let's look at that again. And this explanation, as we talked about yesterday, it comes from the companions themselves. You don't need anyone else today to explain that verse to you. The companions already explained it. So what is Allah saying? Allah is saying that women should not display their decorations, ornaments, designs, jewelry, or anything else used to beautify their appearance, except what a law allows them to display of their appearance. That's what that's saying. It's just the wording is bad. So I can show you what I'm wearing as far as my garments, my dress, my designs and colors, but I can't show you what's underneath this dress. I can show you whatever is on my face, my makeup, my lipstick. I can show you what's on my hand, my fingernail polish, my lotion. You can see those things, but I can't show you what's on my um, uh, upper arms or my breast or my back, or my stomach, or my chest. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so again, let me look at these answers. So again, you know, what is it referring to? Let's see who got it right up here. Ibn Abbas explains, except what is apparent means, kohol, which is makeup. Kohol is makeup and jewelry or rings. Whatever is covering the face and the hands. Okay, whatever is covering the face of the hands, whatever is covering your body, 
the other body parts, what decorations you have in your hijab, you know, your uh, jilbab. Does everybody understand that? Also, another companion said it means the permissibility of showing the face and hands. All of that, the face and hands, all of that, and also includes your clothing too, guys. So for those brothers out there, and we talked about that the other day, who want to tell you that a woman can't wear colors, a woman can't wear jewelry, a woman can't wear designs, that's garbage. You can wear any, any of that. It's just that men have to be careful. Men can't wear bold designs. Men can't wear gold. Yes, Sister Amina, your bracelets, your rings, your makeup, all of that is permissible. So again, guys, this is why it's so important to learn Islam from qualified bona fide teachers of it. Because if you don't have a qualified bona fide teacher, you're going to be learning Islam from somebody who's get, teaching you what they want you to hear or what they want you to know because it's based on what they like and what they don't like. There's a lot of men out there who are insecure. So they want to keep their wives oppressed because they're afraid they're going to lose them because they were abandoned as children. Who knows? But the bottom line is no one can make anything unlawful that a law made lawful. And unless you know what the lawful and the unlawful are, you will find yourself in a situation where you are being oppressed. So for those women that are being oppressed, that's why I always say, you know, a person can only oppress you if you allow it. It's very important for Muslim women to seek knowledge of this religion. So that way you don't end up in a marriage or a situation where some man is oppressing you, stripping you of all your confidence, stripping you of all your self-esteem, breaking you down like the prophet said, to bend her and break her, to break you down to a nothing but a mouse. And you got women committing suicide, women having heart attacks, women stroking out because their husbands broke them down to nothing. But you allowed it because you worshiped your husband instead of worshiping a law. You don't love anybody more than you do yourself. And this is something that I tell people all the time, especially Muslim women, you should only person that you love more than you is a law and a prophet. The order of love for us Muslim women and men is a love for a law comes first. And then you have to love the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After that, you have to love yourself because how can you save yourself from the hellfire if you don't love yourself? How can you save yourself if you loving somebody else on this earth more than you? We women, women are romantics. Women get caught up in the idea of being in love and don't understand what love is. We watch too much of that Titanic garbage. There is no such thing as you jump and I'll jump. No, if you stoop enough to jump in that water, Aki, I'll throw you a life jacket. But if you think I'm jumping in after you, you out your mind. You know, so that you jump, I jump is not right. You know, you have to love yourself, sisters. And if you loved yourself, you wouldn't allow anyone to oppress you. You take the time to learn the true Islam, learn what your rights are as a woman, learn what your husband's rights are as a man, so you can fulfill them for him. And when he transgressed the limits on you, you can do like the female companions did, get up and book. Just to let y'all know, the female companions booked. They didn't allow no man to oppress them because they didn't love no man more than they did a lot. And the men were the same way. They wouldn't put up with a knucklehead wife. they get rid of her in a heartbeat. Okay, so that love stuff, I keep telling y'all love don't love nobody. You better love yourself. Do like Justin Bieber said, love yourself. Okay.
Let's look at the next question. The, the last question here is question number six. Now, there are some scholars out there, and I really didn't speak about this last night, but I hope you guys reviewed the PowerPoint. But this question did come up to me today in the email. There are some scholars out there that say that it's okay for a woman to show the lower part of her arm, the part where her um, the wrist is and that little area there. What do they base that on? Can anybody remember? What do they base that on? There are some scholars that say a woman can show, I must demonstrate, this part of her arm up to right above her wrist. You guys see this? The men, you can look. Everybody can look. What do they base that on? It is okay for a woman to show up to this much of her arm. What do they base that on? Who can remember? The simple fact that I'm doing it means it's correct. You should know I wouldn't, if it was not lawful, Layla wouldn't do it. Do you guys know what they base it on? Based on what? Based on what, who said? Exactly, that's based, good job Zareen. That's based on the, the, the uh, fatwa of Aisha, the wife of the prophet and Katada. Katada, who became uh, one of the um, uh, uh, scholars of Islam. He has a great tafsir. A lot of you read his tafsir and other companions. And they base it on that because we're allowed to show our jewelry. When, like yesterday, if you notice, whenever a woman talks, to, I got on tight sleeves today. This is one outfit I used to wear when I worked so my clients couldn't attack me. But my sleeves won't, won't fall down. But usually if a woman raises her hand up, your sleeves will come down this much. And you can see her bracelet or her watch. So Aisha and Katara and other companions, they said that since a woman, when, if a woman raises up her hand, you can see her, that part of her jewelry, then this is OK. If a woman, that's also included in except what appears naturally except what is apparent because you can't control you know raising your hand or putting your hand up and your sleeve coming down a little bit about like that so that's what those scholars are based that on this is the opinion this is the fatwa of aisha katara and many 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 other companions i think abu Bakr too her father abu Bakr said the same thing too and i think uthman said the same thing too and i think ali said the same thing too so that means no scholar on this planet can out top what Aisha said. No scholar on this so-called planet, you know, understands the Dean better than Aisha or Katata or Abu Bakr and them. So that's why, you know, some of the, the, the scholars that you know will tell you it's okay, if, you know, if you have that much of your arm exposed because you are allowed to show your bracelets anyway. That appears from, that's what's apparent in appearance. Okay, and I meant to, I didn't talk about it yesterday, but someone asked me about it, you know. Well, yes, there's nothing wrong. Your imam told you that's okay. He, he's right, it is. He's basing that on Aisha, what the wife of the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and many of the other, her father and many other companions. Okay, okay setting that up. Okay, are there any questions about any of these answers? Hold on, I want to stop this year. Okay. Any questions about any of those answers? Before we move on, is everybody caught up on the lawful and the lawful of the woman's face and hands and my decorations and my makeup? And my nose ring? And my earrings, my rings on my finger, my everything, all that stuff I can wear. And if you see it, alhamdulillah, you see my nose ring. Hello. 
It's on my face. Yeah, you can look at it. Okay, type your question, Sister Zarina, while I finish my Frappuccino. Hurry up. That's the best part of the Frappuccino, the bottom part with the crunchies in it. Yeah, she's waiting on for her. Any other questions while she types her question? Does anyone else have a question too before we move on to today's lecture? Okay, her question is, is it okay for women to do each other's hair? If you mean comb each other's hair, there's nothing wrong with combing my hair. Yes, we can comb each other's hair and all that, yes. And we're gonna talk about that uh, tomorrow. Okay, if there's no other questions. Now, yesterday's lecture, and the day before lecture day, le le yesterday, a lot of you sisters were happy because you learned that there are not that many restrictions on us. In fact, there's no restrictions for us when it comes to fabric colors, as long as whatever clothing you are wearing is not see-through, and as long as whatever fabric you are wearing covers your body to not show the shape of your of your figure you can wear anything so a lot of you sisters are happy about that also your face does not have to be covered and whatever you put on your face be it makeup or, or jewelry is permissible as long as you're not imitating a prostitute and that's the catch as long as you're not decorating yourself and to go out and pick up men on facebook like the prostitutes do so a lot of you sisters are happy to learn this, but I don't think you sisters are gonna be too happy with today's class. So now the brothers out there, you brothers, y'all can get ready because I don't think the sisters are gonna be too happy with the restrictions for today's class, okay? But so let me go ahead and put that PowerPoint up on the screen here and then we can get started. There's not that many things that are haram for us, but there are some things, not only the see-through clothing, not only tight clothing, but what about the woman's nakedness in public places? This is what we're gonna speak about today. Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned the Muslim woman against entering into public baths and taking off her clothes in front of other women who might make her appearance a topic of gossip. And this is something that you sisters today need to hear because when I look on your Facebook pages, not only do a lot of you women have these so-called life coaches, when the life coach for us is supposed to be the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the life mentor for us are supposed to be his companions. But I also see you sisters with a lot of these exercise, get back to exercise women on your Facebook pages too. And we're going to pump you up. We're going to work you out. You know, join me at the gym. And we're going to pump you up. Well, you sisters need to understand about going to the gym taking off your clothes in front of other women. Because even though a woman's nakedness can be displayed around other women, like say, for example, you're breastfeeding, though you can, you don't have to, you know, cover, you know, you, you, the women can see you breastfeed and stuff like that. Or also like a sister asked, can a woman see another woman's hair? Yes, you can. You can see my hair if you're a woman. I mean, I don't have to put on a gym bag when I'm around another woman. But even though we don't have to, it's best to do it. Because what problem do women have? 
We suffer with diarrhea of the tongue. And also women are jealous of one another. A sister can look at you and see that you got long hair and she's got them dreads in. So she can get jealous of you and then go back and talk about you, say that you got a big derriere or, or just slander you. Or some women are even worse. They may like the way you look and go back and tell your husband. And then they wonder why two months later, you come home from the grocery store and your husband and your friend sitting there grinning and he says, hello, babe, meet your new co-wife. So again, women run their mouths too much. So even though it is permissible, you know, for a woman to uh, show her hair and her, you know, not her naked body, but her, you know, my shape, I can show my shape around another woman, it's still best not to do so. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned, you know, Muslim women about this. And even with Muslim men, uh, the Prophet warned them uh, against going to the public baths without a waist uh, wrapper. A waist wrapper is what the men would put around their waist to cover their from their navel to their knee. In fact, one of the Prophet's companions said, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever believes in Allah and the last day must not enter a public bath without a lower garment to cover his private parts. And whoever believes in Allah the last day must not let his wife go at all to the public bath. So again, I want you sisters to understand this. For those of you who like to pump it up, there's nothing wrong with exercising and working out. But when it comes to let's go in and there and take our shower together, that's a public bath. When it comes to uh, let's go to the, sw the public swimming pool and stuff like that, you sisters need to reconsider this. And I'm going to give you some more hadiths right now that clearly address this, this situation, which is a big problem today. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did make an exception for women going to public baths, to the sauna. Public baths are the sauna and the whirlpool. You want to go to the gym and pump it up. After y'all get through pumping it up, let's go into the sauna together. We're going to do just like this man, put our towels on and go sit in the sauna, sit in the hot tub together. Okay? Now, if you are a woman who has some type of sickness, like say, for example, I'll tell you a good one, uh, arthritis. I suffer with rheumatoid, osteo, whatever arthritis. A hot tub is the best thing for me. God, I wish I had one now. You know, if, I, if the doctor, my Muslim doctor tells me that, one of the, that I should go to a, a hot, uh, to a, the, the gym, you know, get into the sauna and spend about 20 minutes in the sauna and then get into the, um, you know, the whirlpool or the whatever, because it'll help my arthritis. Of course, it has to be an all-female place. Then yes, I can do that. Okay, but if there's no medical reason, you know, you ain't got no business in no public sauna, no public whirlpool, no public uh, any of that. Supana Allah sister. So you guys, you know, and I know a lot of you sisters like to do this stuff, looking at your Facebook pages as y'all pump it out, you know, but this ain't cool. Listen to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, beware of the building called the public bath. And some people said, oh Prophet, it cleans us. It removes our dirt and impurities and impurities of the skin. And it also helps people who are sick. He said, now for the people who are sick, then if they go, they should cover their nakedness. So that's the proof that it's okay, you know, for a woman, you know, whose doctor, your Muslim doctor tells you it's okay. Some women have babies and after they give birth to the child, you know, they go through pain and they'll say, okay, go in here, go to the sauna. It'll help you with that, that tension or whatever. 
But unless it's a medical reason, guys, just for fun and leisure, we're going to go to the sauna together and, and, and we're going to go to the hot tub together. This is not lawful in Islam, guys. So what does that tell you about women going to um, uh, the public beaches and stuff? But before we talk about that, I got some words for you brothers. In fact, let me show this screen. I get a lot of emails from sisters out there who tell me that their husbands won't let them go work out. Understandably. But their husbands have Bally memberships. Their husbands go to co-ed gyms and work out. You brothers ain't got no business doing that. If it was an all-male gym, that's different. But I don't know of any all-male fitness centers. You brothers are pumping it up. And while you pumping it up, you're looking up at these naked women around you who are also pumping it up. I know a few sisters who've told me that their husbands met their, their co-wives at these public fitness places. You know, you brothers are not supposed to be uh, doing that stuff around and looking at women who are not covered properly like that. And then a lot of you brothers are going to the sauna and you're sitting in there with women. You're in the swimming pool the whirlpool bath with, uh, with women who are not mahrams to you, this is haram. We don't do that. So just as women has restrictions on this, you brothers have to understand you're Muslim and maintain some dignity too. And also remember a man's nakedness is from his navel to his knees. For you Muslim men, when you do go to swimming pools and beaches, you better have on some underwear to come down to your knees, not no um, those little uh, thongs that men wear, whatever they call them things that men wear. And you should not be in a pool with a woman who is not like this picture with a bunch of naked women who are not mahrams to you. It better be all men swimming in that pool. Does every man understand that? So the same rules are for you brothers too. And with Muslim women, again, the morals and mannerisms of, of us are different than the morals and mannerisms of non-Muslim women. The Muslim woman is supposed to be chaste, dignified, self-respecting and modest. While non-Muslim women are not chaste, they're not dignified, they're not self-respected. They, they're vain, they love to show off their body parts, okay? So you sisters shouldn't even wanna be around them. We shouldn't get involved in that. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning and stay in your houses and do not make a public display of yourselves in the way that people did before Islam. Qatada, who was also one of the eminent companions and also Mujahid, they said that this verse refers to women, women who used to walk around men in a seductive and sensuous manner. When you go to these public uh, pools and for you brothers out there, you brothers who are pumping it up at these uh, co-ed gyms, surrounded by all these women walking around with their tight-fitting uh, leotards on trying to pick up dudes, because that's what most of the non-Muslim women do at them places. This is not lawful. And for us women, remember, we are ordered to stay in our houses and not go around trying to imitate a prostitute anyway by decorating ourselves, showing our adornment to men who are not part of our immediate family. Okay. Also, another companion said the displaying of attractions means putting a cloth on the head without tying it. Displaying attractions also refers to playing with your necklaces and your earrings in a provocative manner. Bottom line, as Muslim women, we are not supposed to do that. 
That's what the, uh, the, the, the pagans would do. That's what the prostitutes would do. They go in the marketplace, stomp their feet to shake their jewelry. And they toy with their earrings and toy with their braces and make them jingle to get the men to look at them so they could pick them up. Well, we're not supposed to do that. So this is why we need to stay away from those places too. Beaches, public beaches, public spas and all of that. Again, Muslim women and men are supposed to lower their gaze. What does lowering the gaze entail? Lowering the gaze entails not looking at what Allah has forbidden us to, to look at. Allah says in the Quran, in the interpretation of meaning, tell the believing women that they should lower their gazes. And also the same for men. Tell the believing men to lower theirs too. How can you lower your gaze if you're looking at a bunch of women walk around in leotards and a bunch of men walk around in their, those um, those under shorts that men wear displaying their manhood. And again, our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is better for you to be pricked in the head with an arm pick than to even touch a woman who is unlawful to touch. And that's something that you men need to ponder. You working out at the gym or you swimming in a whirlpool bath with a bunch of non-Muslim women. You bump into them. You step on their toe while you going underneath the water or whatever. It would be better if you were pricked in the head with an arm picked and to touch a woman that's unlawful. SubhanAllah. And we don't think about these things. So again, guys, so you can see just from those few verses there as Muslim women and Muslim men, we have to be careful. And I know you want to pump it up. There's nothing wrong with working out. Dr. Jamali works out all the time. But have you seen Dr. Jamali in a gym with a bunch of naked women? Think about it. Dr. Jamali, have you seen him in a gym with a bunch of naked women pumping it up making videos for y'all no you know you brothers need to think about that have you seen dr dramali in a swimming pool with a bunch of non-muslim women swimming out in the background waving in the camera you know as he pumps it out and talks about a loss upon what the eye no so be careful that brothers and for you sisters who want to be liberated women tell your husband you know, to buy you a, a hot tub and put it in the backyard. Or if you got a big enough house, tell your husband to invest money in a swimming pool for you, a private pool for you. Or you can do like one of my friends did. She turned her attic into a sauna. She has her own sauna and everything up there. Supana Allah. You know, but going to the public sauna, the public pool and all of this, we don't do that as Muslims, guys. Not if we truly fear a law and we truly believe in the last day. And again, you know, the clothing that we wear must conform to the standards laid down by Allah's laws. Remember for the Muslim woman, her dress must cover her entire body ex with the exception of that which is apparent which refers to the face, the hands, the colors, and decorations on them. Whatever we wear must not be see-through, revealing what's underneath. It should not be tight, emphasizing our parts. And I know nowadays you have these so-called Muslim swimsuits. Come on, guys. The Muslim swimsuits are tight-fitting. They show your shape. The Muslim swimsuits are tight-fitting. They show your shape. So even if you go to a public pool with one of them on, the people see your shape because those things are tight fitting. This is not lawful for us. Supana Allah. You know, we have to fear Allah, guys. We have a hadith, whereas once some of the women from the tribe of Tamim, they came uh, to where the prophet and his companions were and the women were dressed in see-through clothing. Well, these women came to see Aisha. 
In fact, this is after the prophet died. I can tell you when this happened. Some of the women from the tribe of Tamim, this is when they had embraced Islam. The tribe of Tamim had converted to Islam. This is after the prophet's death. And they came to learn about the religion. And they came to visit Aisha. Aisha would entertain the women and teach them Islam. And when she saw them, she said, wait a minute, if you women are true believers, then you would not wear this type of clothing. You know, Allah forbids us from dressing in see-through clothing. Also on another occasion, a woman got married and she got married in a see-through transparent head covering, which is very popular today. And when Aisha saw her, she said, a woman who dresses like that does not believe in the surah of the light of the Quran. What would she say if she were living today? There's so many sisters that wear those sheer see-through pieces of fabric and tie them on their hair. What's the point? We can see through the, the scarf to your hair. Or some sisters will put a hijab on like I got on, but they have it pulled back where you can see part of their hair or part of their hair is hanging out. This is haram. We, we can't do that. If you're gonna wear a hijab, it has to cover your entire hair. You can't have some parts hanging out and it cannot be see-through. Showing the people that you're not bald, that your hair is long. We have to stop all this nonsense, okay? Also, again, the tightness. Your curves, your shape should not be seen. And also there's nothing in Islam that forbids women from wearing pants. The women wore pants in the days of the prophet. What do you think those women wore underneath when they were riding camels? They had on pants, but their pants were not tight fitting. Their pants were loose. And pants is not a type of clothing that's specific for men anyway. You have female pants and male pants and they're made differently. And also remember as Muslim women, our clothing should not imitate the non-Muslims. That means wearing clothing that's specific to them like the halter top. Looking like J-Lo, looking like Britney. It's Britney, you know, the Muslim woman again is supposed to be dignified and classy. The Muslim woman is supposed to walk and talk in a dignified business-like manner. And by the way, let me emphasize this because you got these brothers out here. The way my voice is, this is how every Muslim woman is supposed to speak publicly. When you are speaking publicly, you are supposed to make your voice strong and direct the way mine is, loud, direct, not soft, not, not whispering, there is no Marilyn Monroe's here. Everybody know who Marilyn Monroe is? If you don't know, Google her. She had one of the most beautiful voices in history. Her voice was sensual, seductive. She could say happy birthday and make a man go crazy. That's what she did to John F. Kennedy. Okay, we can't have voices like that. You have to toughen up that voice, make it strong, make it direct the way mine is and make it, you know, get to the point. Allah says in the Quran and the interpretation of meaning, do not be too pleasant of speech or else a person in whose heart there is a disease will end up feeling desire for you. This is for the women. This is a command from Allah to the women telling us to not be too beautiful and pleasant in our speech publicly because you don't know what lurks in the heart of a man. A woman can turn a man on with just her voice. That's how weak men are to a woman. That's how men fail for Marilyn Monroe and didn't even see her. She was beautiful to look at too, but all she had to do was just say, good morning. And that was it, men were done. You can't speak that way as a Muslim woman. You have to be, your voice must be like man, mine. And this is not a manly voice. There's nothing manly about my voice. The way I speak is the way Aisha spoke publicly. 
This is the way Aisha spoke publicly. This is the way Um Salama spoke publicly. This is the way Hafsa spoke publicly. This is the way Fatima spoke publicly. This is the way Um Hakam spoke publicly. This is the way Um Asara spoke publicly. This is the way Kaula spoke. This is the way all the female companions spoke publicly. So there's nothing manly about the way Layla sounds. It's just that maybe the other women that you're listening to, maybe they're not following that verse of the Quran, but I am. Okay, I am a Sunnah follower. Okay, so Allah tells Muslim women, you know, to be dignified in how we look publicly and also dignified in how we speak publicly too. Okay. And again, we talked about perfume. There's nothing in Islam that forbids a woman from wearing perfume but we cannot wear it to the mosque and we cannot wear it around men who are not immediate relatives of ours because just like a man can easily be turned on to your voice like they were to Marilyn Monroe, a man can be turned on to a woman just by the smell of her, okay? And again, that's why Allah also says in the interpretation of meaning for women to not strike their feet on the ground to make their, their um, jewelry uh, um, to, to, uh, evidence to attract men. Because that's what the prostitutes would do. They'd put on perfume, put on all their heavy jewelry and stomp their feet when they walk by the men to make the jingle sound so the men would look at them and they could pick them up. Also guys, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the woman who perfumes herself and walks through a gathering of men is nothing but an adulteress. It's as if you have committed adultery with every man who smells you as you walk past. So, Perfume is lawful at home. Perfume is lawful around other women, but it's not lawful around men who are not mahrams to you. And this is not, we're not talking about soap. We're not talking about body wash or any of that. That's natural stuff. Body wash and all that stuff will fade off after when the air hits it anyway. We're talking about perfuming yourself with sweet smelling stuff to deliberately intentionally go around men. You know, the, 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 the perfume they put in deodorant and toothpaste and de laundry detergent, that stuff, we're not talking about that. There's nothing you can, that's not the kind of, of stuff we're talking about, okay? So I want you sisters to understand, don't take it to the extreme like some Muslims do where you can't wear lotion or deodorant because it's got a smell to it. No, we're talking about the obvious smell. A man would have to get awful close to you to smell your deodorant on you. He'd have to get awful close to you to smell your bath and body spray too, to be honest. He'd have to get awful close to you. If he's turned on by tide and gain, something wrong with him. I'm sorry, if he's turned on by gain, he's got some issues, okay? So again, you know, be careful of perfume uh, and going out in the public around men. And again, um, no, you can't wear perfume at all to the mosque. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, any woman that comes to the mosque in perfume, her prayers are not accepted until she goes home and takes a gusso to make herself pure. So you don't go to the mosque with perfume on at all if you're a female, okay? And also you brothers, you know, women can go outside the home to take care of their needs. There are some men out there who want to keep their wives just locked in a house. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't keep his wives locked in the house. He allowed his wives to go to the market to take care of their business. He allowed them to go to the mosque and participate at the mosque. The Prophet's wives even participate on the battlefield. Aisha was a nurse 
and she trained Um Salam and a couple other wives to be nurses. They would go out and take care of the wounded. So for you brothers to keep your wives just locked up in the house like a prison, this is something that you really shouldn't do. You know, let them go out to take care of their needs, okay? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed that, you know, that we don't want to be oppressive. You don't want to bend a woman to the point where you break her. So thus, guys, we can see Islam is a beautiful way of life. Allah makes the laws and he makes the rules for our betterment. His laws, his rules are not made to oppress us. They're made to protect us. Muslim women are allowed to live and function in society as long as they adhere to the behavior and the morality that Allah put in effect for us. And the same is expected for men. And like I say, when you got those brothers out there, you know, telling their wives, for example, that they can't go jogging or, you know, they can't go work out, you know, the same rule applies for you. If they, as long as she's not working out around a bunch of men, and as long as she's not taking off her clothes or getting the sauna or the whirlpool, as long as she comes home, she comes home and takes her shower at home, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. But what about you? What are you doing going to Bally's? That's co-ed. What are you doing going swimming in the pool with a bunch of women that's naked? What are you doing sitting up in the hot tub with women and in the sauna with them too? The same rules apply to men that apply to us. We are a people of dignity. We are a people of self-respect. We are a people that love and fear a law. And the law does not discriminate. So why should we? And why do we? Okay. All right. We're going to stop right here for today. If you guys have any questions or comments about anything here, you can type them on the screen.